I think there's no, no question that we need energy. We are sitting here surrounded by, we wouldn't be here, you wouldn't be talking to us without energy. So we really do need to get to solutions. Is it possible to have a, 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 a clean energy supply? And, and if so, what is it? If not, what do we do? So we have built an entire way of life built on finite substances. And this is the problem that no one wants to face. Politicians cannot get elected if they say this out loud. And I think the public at large is just sort of deer in the headlights, frozen in horror, because we see the world going down around us and we don't know what to do. So I, the, first, the first thing we have to do is the proper diagnosis and building a way of life on something that's going to run out. This was inevitable. Uh, and it's a, it was a one-time blowout, industrial civilization. And in the words of Richard Heinberg, the party's over. There were maybe three generations of people who were ever going to get to experience this level of consumption. And it's, it's done. It's over. You know, we're on the downside of that peak. And it doesn't really matter whether it's 10 years or 20 years. Like at, at some point, there, will be, there won't be enough of it left that it's worth to get it out. It's going to take more energy to pump it out than you'll get from the stuff you, that is pumped out. So at that point, it's over. And the end was built into the beginning. This is what happens when you build a way of life on something that's not going to last. Sure, but, you know, someone um, famously and, said, well, the Stone all... Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. I mean, you know, right. things move on. And, and that's where we're trying to get to. We're trying to get to the other, you know, the next, the next iteration. Well, the problem with all of the so-called you know, clean energies is that they're not clean. They all rest on that same industrial platform. You can't create them without the same mining. You can't create them without vast amounts of diesel fuel. Um, it, they're not actually alternatives. And this is why Ozzy Zenner talks about fossil fuel and alternative fossil fuel. Who wants to come in here? Okay, Mike. So Leanne's right that the, in one sense, the part is over in the sense of the kind of wild consumption that we've been doing is going to trash the planet. But in another sense, the party's not over. And it's not as though we suddenly have to get used to a, a, a less fulfilling lives. In fact, if we're smart about it, uh, there's plenty of opportunity and if we were really smart about it, we could live better than ever before. I mean, don't get me wrong. The trajectory we're on at the moment is heading for a very nasty crash, really nasty. And it, because there's lots of things we don't understand about the, the exact way the science works on this, it's even quite possible that we've already crossed some thresholds that are going to take us to a very nasty place, like it or not, even if we take very strong action right now. But it looks likely that if we reframe the debate a lot, and really wake up, insist on much better, uh, much better stuff from our politicians around honesty and honesty and compassion at the global level, and then everything else will start falling out of the hat. Reduce our energy demand absolutely. You talk about developing countries have s s some. In, you know, there are countries that have a legitimate case for a greater energy supply. However. It's not as though they. You know, it's not as though to have good lives, they have to follow our trajectory and and suddenly get themselves up to the energy levels that we're on. You know, a lot of the energy that we burn through at the moment is not optimized for human well-being at all. They can actually do better than the pathway that we've been on. And globally as a whole, with all the efficiency improvements in every field you can think of, if we could only bag the savings from those efficiency improvements, the scope for humanity to reduce its energy demand is absolutely enormous. The problem is that unless we, the way that I've written at the, about this at length, but the way that the dynamics of growth go, is that unless you do something to constrain the resource use, the more efficiency you put into the system, actually the more resources, not less, you end up using. And that's why, no, it doesn't matter how uncomfortable this is, we need to come to an arrangement that leaves the fossil fuel in the ground. And that is separate from anything we do to grow the renewables. It's separate from anything we do about efficiency gain. We have to constrain the resource use in the first place. It's not just fossil fuel, it's all the other, it's, it's all the other things we extract Chris, as well. Well, I think, I think the risk of that, frankly, is that you end up with a very unpredictable and nasty global recession. And I fear that's actually what we're going to see towards the end of this year and next year, precisely because you're taking such a large bite out of people's disposable income and because that means they're going to curtail their consumption and consumption may be something that's at the margin for everybody in this tent, 
but actually consumption for somebody who's on low incomes in uh, Brazil or uh, in India or China is a matter of life or death. So these are real, real uh, d difficult issues. I'd like to come back on something that Leanne's saying as well, because I'm trying to get to what the vision of a future is here if we simply say, okay, we're going to be as green as possible and reject industrial solutions. And it seems to me that we've sold that pass. It's not by accident that people now call this the Anthropocene, the, the man age in terms of uh, the, the ages of the earth, because we are now such a dominant species and we've had so much impact on the planet already. Just to give you a, a, a one figure, and I promise not to give too many, but a few years before I was born in 1950, the population of this planet was two and a half billion people. The population of this planet is now eight billion people. And the reason we're actually able to have fewer proportionately of those people in starvation is because we've had a massive increase in synthetic fertilizer applied to agriculture. So the Green Revolution, uh, enormous increases in output. The first thing that the Chinese asked for when uh, they did the famous deal with Nixon and the opening to China was they placed an order for 13 ammonia plants from the state-of-the-art producer of those plants, Kellogg's, in Texas because they had recently, within living memory, been through a famine, and they never wanted to go through that again. So, you know, I want to try and understand this deep green vision, which says we can actually go back to some world where we don't use a synthetic fertilizer, because actually, I've seen calculations that suggest that that 8 billion population would have to come down to 4 billion. No. In order to be sustainable. Now, I've, you know, okay. maybe, there may be other calculations that it. show less, but the, the reality is it's going to be a smaller population. So is it you or is it you? And which politician is going to have the, effectively uh, the courage to turn around and say, sorry, we're going to be operating a one-child policy in future or even a no-child policy? I'm going to abuse my position here and say that that famine in 1961 was not caused by a lack of fertilizer. It was caused by <laughs> Mao Zedong following Lysenko, seizing grain. Lots of reasons, but not that, Mike. Yeah, no, it's not right that we can't feed um, <laughs> even, the, even 9 or 10 billion people uh, quite happily without, I'm not saying no fertilizer, but drastically reducing our fertilizer use. We can be more efficient in the way that we use it by a lot. And I think you, you're, you're onto that. We can also, you know, the most important thing, uh, you know, simple thing, in, in one sense, simple thing we can do is reduce by a long way the amount of meat and dairy in our diets and the pressure that that will take off the food and land system, not just uh, not just from a climate perspective, but from a feed the world perspective and from a biodiversity perspective as well, will be enormous. We can do stuff around waste, wasting food less, and we can do a lot of stuff around uh, really sort of careful and highly skilled and not fully scientifically understood yet, but emerging practices that enable a lot more productivity out of land uh, with a lot less input. And actually, that requires a lot more people to work on that land. Um, we, we, we run our agricultural system in a way that minimizes the people working on it because that makes it more, e more profitable per person at the moment. But actually, you know, humanity has got people coming out of its ears at the moment. And one of the most fundamentally rewarding ways you could spend your time is actually to work on that land. So we need more people working the land, not less. So there are all sorts of, you know, it's a very complex area, but there are you know, a complete revolution of how we do the food and land system is absolutely part of this. Well, I want to pick up on that. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI TV.